Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 5, 1860-1865, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul, 1812-1888, The Portuguese Duck. A duck once arrived from Portugal, but there were some who said she came from Spain, which is almost the same thing. At all events, she was called the Portuguese, and she laid eggs, was killed, and cooked, and there was an end of her. But the ducklings which crept forth from the eggs were also called Portuguese, and about that there may be some question. But of all the family only one remained in the duckyard, which may be called farmyard, as the chickens were admitted, and the cock strutted about in a very hostile manner. He annoys me with his loud crowing, said the Portuguese duck, but still he's a handsome bird, there's no denying that, although he's not a drake. He ought to moderate his voice like those little birds who are singing in the lime-trees over there in our neighbor's garden. But that is an art only acquired in polite society. How sweetly they sing there! It is quite a pleasure to listen to them. I call it Portuguese singing. If I had only such a little singing-bird, I'd be kind and good as a mother to him, for it's in my nature, in my Portuguese blood. While she was speaking, one of the little singing-birds came tumbling head over heels from the roof into the yard. The cat was after him, but he had escaped from her with a broken wing, and so came tumbling into the yard. "'That's just like the cat. She's a villain,' said the Portuguese duck. "'I remember her ways when I had children of my own. How can such a creature be allowed to live, and wander about upon the roofs? I don't think they allow such things in Portugal.' She pitied the little singing bird, and so did all the other ducks who were not Portuguese. "'Poor little creature,' they said, one after another as they came up. "'We can't sing, certainly, but we have a sounding-board, or something of the kind, within us. We can feel that, though we don't talk about it.' "'But I can talk,' said the Portuguese duck, "'and I'll do something for the little fellow. It's my duty.' And she stepped into the water-trough, and beat her wings upon the water so strongly that the bird was nearly drowned by a shower-bath, but the duck meant it kindly. "'That is a good deed,' she said. I hope the others will take example by it. Tweet, tweet, said the little bird, for one of his wings being broken, he found it difficult to shake himself, but he quite understood that the bath was meant kindly, and he said, You are very kind-hearted, madam, but he did not wish for a second bath. I have never thought about my heart, replied the Portuguese duck, but I know that I love all my fellow creatures, except the cat, and nobody can expect me to love her, for she ate up two of my ducklings. But pray make yourself at home, it is easy to make oneself comfortable. I am myself from a foreign country, as you may see by my feathery dress. My drake is a native of these parts. He is not of my race, but I am not proud on that account. If any one here can understand you, I may say positively I am that person. She is quite full of porchalock, said the little common duck, who was witty. All the common ducks considered the word porchalock a good joke, for it sounded like Portugal. They nudged each other and said, Quack! That was witty. Then the other ducks began to notice the little bird. The Portuguese had certainly a great flow of language, they said to the little bird. For our part, we don't care to fill our beaks with such long words, but we sympathize with you quite as much. If we don't do anything else, we can walk about with you everywhere, and we think that is the best thing we can do. You have a lovely voice, said one of the eldest ducks. It must be great satisfaction to you to be able to give so much pleasure as you do. I am certainly no judge of your singing, so I keep my beak shut, which is better than talking nonsense, as others do. Don't plague him so, interposed the Portuguese duck. He requires rest and nursing. My little singing bird, do you wish me to prepare another bath for you? Oh, no, no, pray let me try, implored the little bird. The water cure is the only remedy for me when I am not well, said the Portuguese. Amusement, too, is very beneficial. The fowls from the neighborhood will soon be here to pay you a visit. There are two Cochin Chinese amongst them. They wear feathers on their legs and are well educated. They have been brought from a great distance, and consequently I treat them with greater respect than I do the others. Then the fowls arrived, and the cock was polite enough today to keep from being rude. You are a real songster, he said. You do as much with your little voice as it is possible to do, but there requires more noise and shrillness in any one who wishes it to be known who he is. The two Chinese were quite enchanted with the appearance of the singing bird. His feathers had been much ruffled by his bath, so that he seemed to them quite like a tiny Chinese fowl. 
He's charming, they said to each other, and began a conversation with him in whispers, using the most aristocratic Chinese dialect. We are of the same race as yourself, they said. The ducks, even the Portuguese, are all aquatic birds, as you must have noticed. You do not know us yet. Very few know us, or give themselves the trouble to make our acquaintance, not even any of the fowls, though we are born to occupy a higher grade in society than most of them. But that does not disturb us. We quietly go on in our own way among the rest, whose ideas are certainly not ours, for we look at the bright side of things, and only speak what is good, although that is sometimes very difficult to find where none exists. Except ourselves and the cock, there is not one in the yard who can be called talented or polite. It cannot even be said of the ducks, and we warn you, little bird, not to trust that one yonder with the short tail feathers, for she is cunning. That curiously marked one, with the crooked stripes on her wings, is a mischief-maker, and never lets any one have the last word, though she is always in the wrong. That fat duck yonder speaks evil of every one, and that is against our principles. If we have nothing good to tell, we close our beaks. The Portuguese is the only one who has had any education, and with whom we can associate, but she is passionate, and talks too much about Portugal. I wonder what those two Chinese are whispering about, whispered one duck to another. They are always doing it, and it annoys me. We never speak to them. Now the drake came up, and he thought the little singing bird was a sparrow. Well, I don't understand the difference, he said. It appears to me all the same. He's only a plaything, and if people will have playthings, why let them, I say. Don't take any notice of what he says, whispered the Portuguese. He's very well in matters of business, and with him business is placed before everything. But now I shall lie down and have a little rest. It is a duty we owe to ourselves that we may be nice and fat when we come to be embalmed with sage and onions and apples. So she laid herself down in the sun and winked with one eye. She had a very comfortable place, and felt so comfortable that she fell asleep. The little singing bird busied himself for some time with his broken wing, and at last he lay down too, quite close to his protectress. The sun shone warm and bright, and he found out it was a very good place. But the fowls of the neighborhood were all awake, and to tell the truth, they had paid a visit to the duck yard, simply and solely to find food for themselves. The Chinese were the first to leave, and the other fowls soon followed them. The witty little duck said of the Portuguese that the old lady was getting quite a doting ducky. All the other ducks laughed at this. Doting ducky, they whispered. Oh, that's too witty. And then they repeated the former joke about porch lock and declared it was most amusing. Then they all lay down to have a nap. They had been lying asleep for some time when suddenly something was thrown into the yard for them to eat. It came down with such a bang that the whole company started up and clapped their wings. The Portuguese awoke, too, and rushed over to the other side. In so doing, she trod upon the little singing bird. Tweet, he cried. You trod very hard upon me, madam. Well, then, why do you lie in my way? she retorted. You must not be so touchy. I have nerves of my own, but I do not cry tweet. Don't be angry, said the little bird. The tweet slipped out of my beak unawares. The Portuguese did not listen to him, but began eating as fast as she could, and made a good meal. When she had finished, she lay down again, and the little bird, who wished to be amiable, began to sing. Chirp and twitter, the dewdrops glitter, in the hours of sunny spring. I'll sing my best, till I go to rest, with my head behind my wing. Now I want to rest after my dinner, said the Portuguese. You must conform to the rules of the house while you are here. I want to sleep now. The little bird was quite taken aback, for he meant it kindly. When Madame awoke afterwards, there he stood before her with a little corn he had found, and laid it at her feet, but as she had not slept well, she was naturally in a bad temper. "'Give that to a chicken,' she said, "'and don't be always standing in my way.' "'Why are you angry with me?' replied the little singing bird. "'What have I done?' "'Done?' repeated the Portuguese duck. "'Your mode of expressing yourself is not very polite. I must call your attention to that fact.' It was sunshine here yesterday, said the little bird, but today it is cloudy and the air is close. You know very little about the weather, I fancy, she retorted. The day is not over yet. Don't stand there looking so stupid. But you are looking at me just as the wicked eyes looked when I fell into the yard yesterday. Impertinent creature, exclaimed the Portuguese duck. Would you compare me with the cat, that beast of prey? There is not a drop of malicious blood in me. I've taken your part, and now I'll teach you better manners. So saying, she made a bite at the little singing bird's head, and he fell dead on the ground. 
Now whatever is the meaning of this, she said, could he not bear even such a little peck as I gave him? Then certainly he was not made for this world. I've been like a mother to him. I know that, for I've a good heart. Then the cock from the neighboring yard stuck his head in, and crowed with steam-engine power. You'll kill me with your crowing, she cried. It's all your fault. He has lost his life, and I'm very near losing mine. There's not much of him lying there, observed the cock. Speak of him with respect, said the Portuguese duck, for he had manners and education, and he could sing. He was affectionate and gentle, and that is as rare a quality in animals as in those who call themselves human beings. Then all the ducks came crowding round the little dead bird. Ducks have strong passions, whether they feel envy or pity. There was nothing to envy here, so they all showed a great deal of pity, even the two Chinese. We shall never have another singing bird about us. He was almost a Chinese, they whispered and then they wept with such a noisy clucking sound that all the other fowls clucked too, but the ducks went about with redder eyes afterwards. We have hearts of our own, they said. Nobody can deny that. Hearts, repeated the Portuguese, indeed you have, almost as tender as the ducks in Portugal. Let us think of getting something to satisfy our hunger, said the drake. That's the most important business. If one of our toys is broken, why, we have plenty more. End of the Portuguese Duck Recording by Faith Pack